I can see myself. Evening, folks. How are you? It's been an absolutely miserable day out there today, isn't it? Absolutely miserable. Cold and wet. It's been horrible. But uh, uh, we've got a uh, fantastic webinar tonight. We've got a load of special guests this evening. Uh, so, uh, actually, without any further ado, the funny works. Uh, this works. <coughs> there we are. So, uh, let's see who's, who's with us tonight. Who've we got? Uh, James, are you, uh, you still with us? Hi, Michael. Certainly am. How are you doing? James, how are you? Not too bad. Are you right? You've had a, had a fun yeah. day? Not too bad. Uh, no, not really. As you say, it's been pretty miserable, isn't it? So, yeah, absolutely horrible. Um, absolutely horrible out there. It really yeah, has. Yeah, uh, Barry, you over there in Rye? Yeah, hi, Michael and James. Hi, Barry. Barry. Barry, have you been outside? I went outside for uh, about lunchtime today. It was it was so cold. It was miserable. Have, uh, have you been out at all? I've just ventured out once for about 10 minutes and then decided I'd better just come back in again. <laughs> yeah, it's much nicer in here. Now, we've got some um, special guests this week. Now, Charlotte's not here this week. She's got another week off. She's probably down the pub having a, um, well, can, you, can you be served in pubs now? I'm not sure what the rules are. No one knows what the rules are anymore. No one knows what the rules are. But uh, uh, we do have some guests now. We're joined this week uh, by Sarah Ward. Uh, Sarah, are you magically going to appear? Hey. Hello. All right. Sarah's our living seas officer from the Wildlife Trust. I haven't seen Sarah for a long time in, in, in person, as it were. So it's good to see you. And um, now Sarah's, Sarah's son may make some noise in the background, or it may, so if, you, if, you, if Sarah say vanishes, um, <laughs> you may have to go and attend a younger person uh, elsewhere. Hopefully not. Uh, hopefully not. But, uh, and also we're joined by Sean Ashworth. Sean, are you there? Hello, Michael. Hello, Hi. everyone. Hi, Sean. Hi, Sean. Uh, Sean's from, from IFCA, the Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority. We're going to be talking about fish later on uh, this evening. I'm, I'm quite excited about uh, talking about a very big fish uh, later on. So uh, I've got some experts in because I know nothing about fish as, uh, as we'll see later on uh, in tonight's <laughs> webinar. Now, where are we? Let's have a look. What's, what's come next? Yeah, and of course, we always ask people, how are you and how have you been uh, in, in the past week? How have you been? Now we've got, uh, this is the interactive part of the, uh, of the show where we've got, uh, we've got a poll. Now, so if I can get my thing to, to launch. How have you been this week? There we are. Look, there's, there's, there's your options, folks. How have you been? Where are you? What are you up to? What have you been doing? Um, you can vote, we vote and see how we've been getting on. Well, some people there down the pub eating a uh, substantial Scotch egg. Um, <laughs> also, people excited for Christmas, so that's good to see. Uh, and there's a few people there already in the vaccine queue. I'm sure that they're camping out to get the best, uh, the best fresh vaccines. And a few people are not as miserable. Uh, oh, 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 that's a shame. They are as miserable as I was last week. I wasn't that miserable last week. I did make a point of, uh, I had a bit of a long, tough week last week. Um, and I just, um, but I've cheered up since then. I've cheered up since then. So, uh, so let's uh, end the polling. And uh, I think most people are okay. Uh, some people are having a scotch egg. Uh, most people are all right. Um, there we go. Look, there's the results. And of course, for those of you who haven't uh, tuned in before, oh, wait a minute, I need something to close this now. Look, okay, I'll stop that. Oh, yeah, press that. Okay, here we are. Um, for those of you who haven't tuned in before, we do have uh, a little Q&A thing at the bottom of the screen or the top of the screen. And, and feel free to write some questions there. Um, we won't answer them or look at them. We, we, we may do, perhaps. But uh, uh, if you do have any questions, uh, we, we, tend, we tend to answer them the week after uh, you ask the question. It takes us a week to, uh, to look on Wikipedia and find the answers. But uh, <laughs> any comments, put them down there. And if we have time, we'll have a look at them uh, as we go through. So. Uh, I hope you're okay. Hope you've all got through this week all right. Uh, we've got uh, so plenty of things to talk about this evening to uh, hopefully lift your spirits and distract you uh, from the horrible weather uh, outside. Now, last week we had uh, another busy show where those of you who watched last week would have remembered it was the monumental occasion where I learned how to work, how to work Zoom a bit better uh, than my, my usual um, awful te uh, technological skills. But we had, um, we had Isla come on the show with her mum to talk about uh, seals. And she also named our woodcock. We had um, uh, Tony come on after a woodcock hit his window and ended up in my freezer. And uh, we do have William, uh, the woodcock, there he is. He's still here, he's still watching the show. Um, Isla named him William last week. We had John, John Arnott from Chichester Harbour uh, talking about seals. And of course, there's the usual nonsense. Uh, there's some Portuguese man of war pasties and all sorts of things. Uh, but you can watch, if you, if you do want to watch that show, it's actually on, uh, on the Wildlife Trust website uh, on Catch Up. Now, uh, I mentioned the woodcock last week. William the woodcock, here he is. Uh, there he is, look. Um, there's William. Um, and Barry, you mentioned last week, we've had, we had four weird woodcock facts. Uh, and your woodcock fact was about the woodcock's eyesight. And 
you, you mentioned this book. Picture. Where's the, uh, you mentioned this book here, which is the fantastic uh, Reader's Digest uh, book from the 1960s, 1970s. You find these in, uh, in charity shops quite a lot. Amazing artwork. But there were some amazing facts in there. And since then, we've had someone send in uh, a scan to illustrate your point. Do you, do you, wanna, do you wanna repeat your facts and figures, Barry, from last okay, week? Well, I haven't seen my book of British birds for uh, probably about a decade. And I have a, a, a strong memory of a, a chart in this book showing where the eyes on the back of a woodcock's head give it 360 degree vision. So I was really pleased that Janet sent us um, these um, yeah, charts showing the difference between an owl's binocular vision Okay, there's that. So, the, just, so just so it can see the owl sees. So the black area there, folks, because you can't read the text. The black area is what it can't see. So uh, it can see forward, but it can't see the back. Okay, Barry. So here's a pigeon. Yeah. So so for the owl, it has to twiddle its head round to look around, and they can do that very well. A pigeon's got pretty good vision, but nothing compared to the 360 degree view of, of the woodcock. And I can't imagine what it actually sees in its mind when it's with its overlapping eyes. <laughs> I was thinking that as well, because, you know, that, that little black area there is where it can't see. So it can't see the base of its bill, basically, but it can see. So it, what must be in its brain, it can see everything all the way around. That is absolutely incredible. Absolutely amazing. So there's, the, there's William the Woodcock there. But there's, there's these pictures here, Barry, which kind of show it's the position of the eye, isn't it, which makes the difference on the... Uh, yeah. Yeah. So there's... Well, we do actually have, of course, we have a prop, an actual woodcock here, but there's a woodcock side view. There's a woodcock front view, so it's, uh, its eyes can sort of face forward. There he is. But here's the amazing picture, Barry. Here's the, here's the, here's the, here's the rear view. Of, look at this. Yeah, yeah. Literally got eyes in the back of its head. Absolutely incredible. Um, so it's going to be spending most of its time with its beak in the ground, um, looking vertically down. So uh, any, anything that's creeping up behind it, It'll easily spot. Wow, absolutely, uh, absolutely amazing. So we'll go through some of the photographs sent in. So thank you to Janet to send in those uh, those scans. Thank you, Janet. Uh, we'll go through some of the photos that you've been sending in on the Nature Table Facebook page uh, this week. Uh, so Karen sent this a picture of this um, rather unruly nuthatch who was going for the peanut in the uh, in, in the bird feeder uh, and throwing out everything else apart from the uh, apart from the peanut, which which you got in the end. And I do love a nuthatch. I love a notch. Um, and there's a picture from Sophie Elizabeth, uh, an evening treat, she said. Um, and I thought it was a picture of uh, uh, some cows. I thought maybe that's uh, an evening treat for Sophie, is watching a few cows walking along a riverbank. But then I noticed, of course, down the bottom of the picture, uh, she's referring to um, a common seal, a common seal. I think this could be the one near Henfield, or maybe it's the one not the use. But uh, it, we, we talked last week about John saying our common seals go inshore uh, in the, uh, up, the, up the rivers of Sussex. And this one here, of course, guys, is uh, she's uh, bananaing, as, as we learned last week. Um, John taught us that uh, when seals do this, that they move their fat and they move their heads up and, uh, and their tails up when they're at rest out of the water. It's called bananaing. So that's um, a new verb I've learned this week. So uh, that's, that's pretty good. And, um, and yesterday, oh, I'm not sure if any of you were around yesterday, James did a fantastic talk yesterday on the thrushes uh, in winter. Um, I thought it went very well, James. I think it did, yeah. We had a bit of a sound problem, didn't we, briefly? Uh, but it was all right, nothing too bad. Yeah, I think we got over that. I think I might have been the only one listening to the uh, the calls, whereas everybody else was sitting in silence. But <laughs> yeah, well, what I've done, uh, is, uh, James put together some some fresh calls on a when this when this webinar ends, you you get a link and it goes right through to a page of, of fresh calls which uh, which James has put together, so you can learn your your fresh calls. But it wasn't too bad yesterday. I think maybe it was my ears that were playing up. I, I'm not too sure, but. Um, no, I think it was the technology. No complained. No one complained. Oh, it was free, so you couldn't complain, really. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, no, no one complained. So, uh, that was fine. And just to, you know, these thrushes are arriving and they're out and about. This is a picture taken on the on last Sunday's Back Garden Bird Race. Uh, here's uh, Ryan over at NET who photographed uh, a red wing there. Um, so, that's great. And I, I took some, I've got some of my photos, James, uh, from the week. Here's my, uh, here's a picture. And in this picture, I was up on the downs in the week. There's actually 200 field fairs in this picture. <laughs> believe it or not uh, they're in the trees over there you couldn't you couldn't see them but they were you know i, I couldn't get very close to my little pocket camera and what i was trying to get of course the picture i was trying to get was this uh, this picture here uh, of a, a lovely field fair so um you captured the mood though michael i think i got the mood exactly that's what I, that's what i was aiming for trying it's uh very atmospheric uh, my photograph <laughs> um 
so yeah, so lots of thrushes are coming in now, lots of winter birds arriving from the, from the north. And uh, we've had lots of photos still of, on, the, on the Facebook page of fungi. And uh, so this is, this is the part of the show where I bring in uh, our, our resident and local uh, mycologist, uh, Claire Blenko, the, the internet sensation. Claire, Claire. There she is, it's over here. Come, come and join us. Sarah, okay. folks. So, so Claire, so just, uh, just a quick review of some of the fungi photos that have been sent in. Uh, so there's still plenty of fungi around. A nice one here by Caroline uh, of a clouded funnel. Um, now, this one's one of the wax caps. Claire, any ideas on this one from Chris? Yes, well, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking probably a scarlet wax cap. They have a slightly nodulose cap. And if you, if you look at how the light's coming off it, you can see it's got a slightly bumpy texture to it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a punt on scarlet. What's the word you use then? Nodulose. All right. So what, the, what, what word do you use there, week, James? Loquacious. Loquacious, yeah. yeah this yeah. this webinar does improve my vocabulary. We've got, we've got, we've got, <laughs> uh, what I really want is a, a, a track a sentence which has loquacious, nodulose, and banana ring in it. Uh, that's what I need to try and. Uh, it's worth, uh, worth uh, aiming for next week, maybe. Yeah, we'll aim for that. <laughs> um, Claire, what's going on here? So another wax cap. Yep, another wax cap. These yellow ones can be a bit tricky, and you really need to get a look at the gills. Um, if the gills sort of go attach straight to the stem, then they're quite likely a butter wax cap. But these ones look like they're sort of kicking up a bit uh, towards the stem. So I think this might be a golden wax cap, but they're a bit tricky to do from photos. Okay, all right. And there's some lovely photos by James and Dawn Langovich who, who post on our uh, page, incredible pictures here. This is a lovely frosty bonnet. Um, look at that, so beautiful. Magical. Magical, um, nodulose. And then uh, here's uh, some fluted birds' nests on this uh, on this branch here. Um, another nice picture. Now look at this. This is um, fenugreek stork ball. I mean, I wish I was called fenugreek stork ball. I would love to. In fact, can, I, can I change my name? Can I change my name on this. I think I can. Can I? Okay. While well, you do that, this is one of those examples where up close photography can be a bit deceptive in terms of. Wait a minute. I, I, I've done something wrong. Yeah, press the wrong button. One second, look. I'm trying to change my name here. Um, cancel that. Look, I'm trying to change my name to Fenugreek Stork Ball. Sorry, Claire, carry on. Look. Um, so these, these are really tiny. They grow in the cracks in bark. Uh, and I did see these at Woods Mill the other week. Um, so you, if, if you sort of stare at the bark on, on trees, uh, you, may, you might catch a glimpse of them. And one of their, one of their interesting features is they smell of, smell of curry. <laughs> which is where they get their name from, Fenugreek Stork Ball. That's better. Okay. Uh, now, um, good name. Lovely. Slime oh, look at this. Look. This is this, this, this is this is this is a uh, nodulus or whatever. This is uh, some more slime mold here. This is uh, a, a taken by James and Dawn. Um, yeah. Well, that, that, that's definitely slime mold, Claire. Yeah. Well, it's not what I think it is. I think, right? I I think it's it. definitely slime mold. It's very. Yeah, uh, which brings us, of course, to uh, a section of the show which I announced last week, uh, which was um, dogs vomit slime mold or actual dogs vomit. A lot of people <laughs> have been seeing um, a dogs vomit slime mold and, and uh, questioning what it was. Uh, Sophie and Ryan had spotted some last week. So I asked people to send in their photos of, uh, of dogs vomit slime mold or even actual dogs vomit and see uh, if, uh, if we can, if Claire can judge them. So here's actually, this is my, I was at Woods Mill this week and here's, um, uh, here's uh, some, what's what I think is dog's vomit slime mold, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so. good. Um, oh, it's a nice email we had from Helena. It said, I must say that the SWT has been absolutely amazing in providing so many interesting and informative talks over lockdown. So well done, well, well done, folks. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Helena, for that. Uh, but she then asked, um, I was weeding some flowers uh, the other day, and is it dog's vomit slime mold, as you showed on your great nature table session this week? Thank you very much. Uh, so Claire, is that is that dog's vomit slime mold or actual dog's vomit on a? Uh, I'm going to pass because it's, it's it's not quite close enough to get a look at the texture. And it's normally when you see slime molds, they're in a in a discrete patch, but that's sort of really spread about. So I'm not sure what's going on there. Mm, so possible dog, ac possible actual dog's vomit in that one. Uh, here's one from Andrew Holloway. Um, thank you, Andrew. That this, yeah, okay with that. Uh, yeah, 
Pelagoceptica. It's dog's vomit slimehole, which is a confusing name because there's two different species that get called dog's vomit slimehole. Okay, all right. Pelagoceptica is, is a yellow one, and Mucilago crustacea is a sort of creamy coloured one. And that, that one looks more like the creamy coloured one to me, but I'm not a slime mold expert. Are you a dog sick expert? Dog I'm not a dog, I've never okay. had a dog. Don't know anything about dog sick. Okay, all right. So thank you, Andrew, for uh, for your dog's vomit slime mold. Now, this one from Sue. As requested, um, dog's vomit slime. That looks, yeah, that looks right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's one from uh, Sarah. Actual dog's vomit. Yeah. yeah okay. okay. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll change that one. Um, so thank you. Oh, it's actually, it's actually, we had a picture from Alison. Uh, Alison said, "We really enjoy your nature table evenings. Uh, your witty delivery. Brian's at these difficult times. It's probably referring to you, Barry, I think." Um, and she's uh, she had went out uh, with her her grandchildren looking for, for fungi, and uh, while was out with our grandchildren on Saturday. A fungi hunting inspired by Claire. Uh, I took my normal family snaps. When I got home, we noticed something strange had happened to the children's bodies. It's quite a strange picture. So um, somehow the, uh, the children's the children's legs have been separated from their torsos. Is, is that some sort of side effect of the fungi hunting? You, you're aware of? <laughs> well, fungi do have all sorts of amazing properties that we don't fully understand, but I'm not sure the sort of bending time and space is one of them. Well, it's funny you say that, but um, yeah, it's uh, well, okay. Well, thank you. Well, hopefully, uh, your grandchildren will reattach, uh, Alison, after that. So it's very strange. Uh, very strange. So here's uh, uh, Graham says some photos. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. He's off there. Okay. So she's back on the sofa over there now, reading her fungi book. Um, uh, here's some photos uh, sent in by uh, Graham. Uh, Graham uh, Hersey, who sent some photos in from a day out at Rye Harbour. Looking good over there, Barry, or Rye Harbour, looking full of uh, widgeons and lapwing and all sorts. Yeah, it's looking very, uh, very wintry now. Very wet. If you look at the back, there's something quite unusual. We'll get a bit closer in, in Graham's picture. He said that the highlight of his trip was a stunning spoonbill, and uh, he took a lovely picture of the spoonbill in flight there. So um, uh, I think it's time to go over to, um, uh, to Barry for Barry's rye, uh, rye Roundup. And this week, Barry, I, I wouldn't mind learning a bit more about your... <laughs> Learn a bit more about your spoonbill over there. Okay, well, spoonbills used to be very um, rare here, but they've become a regular feature. And I think it's because um, there's now a small breeding population in Norfolk and they winter, most of them, down in Pool Harbour. And a few stop off with us every year. So here's a, a video of one. It should start moving in a minute. But oh, yeah, sorry, yes. Spoonbills. Sorry, no, sorry. Characteristically, just say, Barry, it's a, it's a little bit loud, the videos, because it's a bit windy, so just uh, you have to just shout over it. Okay. So spoonbills spend most of their time like this, <laughs> asleep, and um, they're really quite small. So those little ducks are teal, our smallest ducks, and as this swan flies, <laughs> swims by, you can see how grubby, um, how off-white the spoonbill is. And fortunately, these, I think the swan startled the spoonbill and it wakes up and you'll be able to see, oh, not very quickly. I hoped, I hoped you were gonna be able to see the little black wingtips, which show that this bird is a, a juvenile. So it's, it's been spending a lot of time around our various wetlands, um, catching fish and prawns in that massive um, beak which it um, dips into the water um, open and when it feels something between it, it snaps shut and uh, catches its food. Would you describe that bill, Barry, as spatulate? I would. But is it a <laughs> no, bill? Another new word. Is it a right, bill or, or is it a beak? Oh yeah, it's a bill is a beak, that's a tough one. I'm always, we've, I think been, that's... we've been writing an interpretation this week for the Discovery Centre and we, we had a bit of a problem over what we were going to call this. So it's a spoonbill with a spatulate beak. Okay, spatulate. Okay. And there's a photo here taken by Sophie May uh, Lewis, as she was many years ago at Pagham Harbour. But I think the next picture shows you the, the black wing tips, Barry. Yeah, so the, the adults have got completely white wings. Um, and it's, it's often the case that it's the young birds, the one-year-old birds that stop off and, and lingo in places such as Rye Harbour and Pagham Harbour. Such a such an amazing bird. They really are. It's so it's weird, isn't it? That, that, that beak slash bill is just, just odd. 
Thank you, Barry. There's, um, there's been some other photos. Now, these birds, uh, 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 Polly sent some photographs of some carrion crows in, which um, you know, uh, usually don't look at carrion crows twice, but I thought this picture was absolutely gorgeous. Look at this, look at the iridescence that uh, she's captured on this uh, crow. What a lovely picture. I do like crows, but uh, it's a really nice uh, picture uh, by Polly there. A lovely photo here by, uh, by Maria, taken in Coombe Valley of a kestrel, a nice male kestrel. Uh, there's actually another photo sent in by Polly uh, of a male kestrel uh, uh, this week. Again, gorgeous looking birds, look at him there. Um, James, I was, gonna, I was gonna have to chat because um, there's plenty of other sort of birds of prey around, some of which are actually being pushed into Sussex by the cold weather. So uh, do you have some, uh, uh, do you have some, uh, some top tips on winter birds of prey for us? Yeah, no worries. Um, so I mean, obviously, as you say, there's, there's, wow, look at that. That's, uh, that's a lot more hen harriers than you would yeah. ever anticipate <laughs> seeing in the same place at the same time. Just to point out, this is actually, this actually isn't actually a real photo. In case I, yeah, I got this online, it's, it's not, actually it's you not. wouldn't see this. <laughs> um, what is quite nice actually from that photo is you can see there's a there's a male and a female right at the very top, um, and they're actually it looks like they're they're passing food there. It looks like the male's actually passing food to the female. Uh, but actually in the breeding season, then uh, if you're very lucky, and unfortunately not really in this part of England, then you actually might see their beautiful display flight, which is known as a sky dance. Uh, it's really stunning and there's many, many videos online that you can find um, to check it out. So you can see on this um, definitely not fake image of hen harriers uh, that the male is just a really beautiful bird. He's got that lovely kind of soft gray plumage uh, with the black wing tips. And actually, you can just see there's one at the bottom as well, where you can just see evidence of the white rump. Now, the female, of course, is a more heavily kind of mottled brown bird. She does still have the white rump and she has uh, sort of rings around her tail, uh, which gives them the kind of common name. of You know, people often refer to the females as ring tails. So, you know, the hen harrier, it, it's obviously a bird that, that really, you know, breeds up in Scotland and to a much lesser extent in England now. Um, you know, unfortunately, we don't have many breeding hen harriers left. Uh, in England at the moment. Um, that's probably not a topic that we're going to start on for tonight. Otherwise that, well, yeah, that will be quite controversial. Um, so yeah, you know, but it, it, winter is the time when we get the opportunity to see the hen harriers. You know, they disperse a lot wider. They move down to kind of lowland farmland, um, you know, coastal marshes. So, you know, do keep an eye out for them. Uh, you know, when they are sort of flying low over the marshland, um, you know, looking for young waders and sort of pipits uh, to hunt, then generally, you know, they'll hold the wings in their shallow V as well, uh, which is, you know, very distinctive amongst the Harriers. So, yeah, look out for those. It'd be a great bird to see. They're certainly still very scarce. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, one bird I've been trying to see, that's what I've been hiking over the downs for every uh, every week. I've been looking to see... Um, oh, press the button here, look. Press the button, there we are. Look, I see these guys here, James, Merlins. Yeah, beautiful bird. And really compact bird as well. It, it, you know, it always seems amazing to think that, you know, a male merlin might only be just very slightly bigger than a missile thrush. I mean, isn't that, that's just a bizarre fact. It, it, it's very hard to kind of imagine that, I think. Um, you know, much like the hen harrier, this is a bird that, you know, kind of breeds on upland moors. Um, and actually in recent times um, on the edge of kind of conifer plantations as well. But I think, you know, this is one of those situations where, you know, their, their kind of typical moorland habitat has really been encroached upon. Um, so perhaps it's a case of birds kind of adapting, um, you know, to these kind of conifer nesting areas. Um, you know, winter, again, is the, the key time to see merlins down here. Uh, you know, they don't really breed in this part of the country. Um, and really, they're dispersing, you know, sort of far and, far and wide. Um, you know, you tend to see them around sort of coastal and uh, estuarine marshes. Rye Harbour, of course, um, as Barry would, would tell you, is a great place to spot merlin in winter. Um, and, you know, often uh, people tend to see the most when they're hunting because, you know, they've got a very fast kind of dashing low level flight. Um, it can be quite confusable with Sparrowhawk. They, they can look quite similar if you only get brief views, uh, particularly in that, that situation. Probably what I would say as well, if you ever see like a small kind of fast flying bird of prey and you, you happen to follow it up a country lane in your car and it flies in front of your car, it will invariably be a Sparrowhawk, not a Merlin. Um, because that's the kind of hunting territory for them. Um, probably most of the birds that we see here in winter are usually juveniles as a whole, uh, but a very, you know, really pretty little falcon. And unfortunately, they do have the habit of, um, you know, sort of perching on rocks and posts and, uh, and similar little sort of outcrops, uh, you know, so that, that is often a good, good, uh, good place to look out for them as well. Lovely little bird, aren't they? Beautiful. Now, something that some birds I have seen in Sussex, uh, 
uh, over the last few years are short-eared owls. So yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, the short-eared owl is, uh, you know, it's quite a nomadic bird, actually. You know, short-eared owls, they, they sort of tend to, um, you know, they sort of tend to breed and, and winter wherever food is most abundant. Um, I have to say, actually, I, I was very lucky because when I worked uh, on the Hebrides, um, you know, surveying different bird populations up there, the short-eared owl was a bird that I saw almost every single day on the Hebrides. Uh, it was just fantastic, absolutely fantastic. And of course, you know, uh, the short-eared owl, you know, they, they kind of breed in Scotland and, and Wales and kind of northern England, but again, not really down in this part of the country. Um, you know, they are sort of partially diurnal, so you often see them out hunting in the day anyhow. Um, you know, particularly around dawn and dusk. But of course, the thing that makes the difference in, in more kind of northern parts of the country is it's obviously light, you know, pretty much all the way through the day and night in summer. Um, so, of course, diurnal hunting sort of happens even at two in the morning, hypothetically. Um, you know, great bird to see. Uh, they're quite unusual because they do tend to roost on the ground, um, although that, that, that doesn't prohibit them from tree roosting as a whole. Um, but, you know, the ground seems to be quite sort of favoured. Um, and I think in winter as well, you know, we if you kind of look out around coastal areas, but, you know, anywhere where there's rough grassland um, that holds kind of suitable prey for them, you know, which is going to be things like short tailed field voles and sort of smaller birds, etc. Um, but we do get kind of bolstered by, you know, um, sort of immigrants from the continent as well. So that's... Sorry, sorry, I just changed, I just changed your picture by mistake. Sorry, go on. That's, my, that's right. I pretty much finished on, on short tail. Oh, that's, that's fine. I couldn't think of anything else to say at the moment. Oh, fair enough. Well, that's, uh, but I put the last one in, James. Sorry, because... Uh... Yeah, I get quite excited about these, but uh, this is a real yeah. rarity, though, a real rare bird, which we do see sometimes in Sussex, but uh, but not indeed. very often. No, indeed. I mean, generally, you know, to see a rough leg buzzard, then really you need to be over in kind of Scandinavia, you know, in spring and summer. So this is a bird of, you know, the kind of treeless uh, sort of subarctic, essentially. So, you know, Finland was the last place, actually, that I, that I was where I was seeing quite a lot of rough leg buzzard. Um, you know, this is basically, this is a vagrant, a vagrant bird. Um, you know, that we tend to see on sort of passage, uh, you know, usually in late autumn. Um, but some of the birds actually, they, they will overwinter and stay here. Um, I, I guess the thing with rough buzzard is they really can be confused for really pale morph common buzzard. Um, and this is a big problem, uh, particularly in winter for maybe kind of anybody who hasn't necessarily looked very closely at a lot of buzzards. Um, you know, the rough leg buzzard, they probably do tend to hover a little bit more than, than common buzzard, even though common buzzard actually, you know, does do a fair bit of hovering itself. Um, they don't breed here, of course. Do we have any other photos? of? of no, sorry, I, I, I can find for free online. Okay, so no worries. Well, I suppose, uh, you know, we probably haven't really got time for a, for a kind of ID guide anyway. But I mean, the one thing I would say with the rough leg buzzard is it's really striking bird, isn't it? I mean, absolutely gorgeous because mm. of the, that kind of pale plumage. But there are some really kind of precise features uh, that you would need to look out for because, of course, you do get really pale morph common buzzards as well. And yeah, they, they can be a bit of a conundrum. You would have to sort of carefully look at different features. Uh, I would say any really, really pale buzzard outside of winter that you spot in the UK is almost certainly going to be a pale common buzzard. Uh, but obviously in winter, there's the possibility of the rough leg buzzard. Uh, if you happen to live on the west of England, then it's very unlikely to be a rough leg buzzard because obviously all the birds pretty much come from Scandinavia and, uh, you know, sort of that, that area, uh, Northern Europe. But yeah, if you live on the East Coast and in the Southeast where we are, then, you know, they're great candidate areas really for seeing rough leg buzzard. Yeah, so, yeah. I, saw one, uh, I saw one a while back at uh, up near Friston Forest. There's one there for quite a while, a few winters back. Oh yeah, I, I vaguely um, remember that. I remember that being yeah. reported. Yeah, beautiful though, really beautiful. Yeah. Hey, Jess, how's, um, how's Rye Harbour been for, uh, for short-eared owls this year, Barry? Any, any sightings? Yeah, they've been fairly regular. Um, none seen today in the pouring rain because nobody's been looking for them. That's fair enough. Uh, I think Dave, our warden, saw one yesterday. Okay. Yeah. All right, so they're there. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. And Merlin um, and Marsh Harriers. Yeah. Which uh, brings us now, of course, to um, uh, my favourite part of the show. Um, it's a mystery bird sounds played badly on a variety of musical instruments. So, uh, Sean, if you if you want to take part, you're welcome to join in, as you are at home, of course, to join in. I, I uh, originally a few weeks back uh, we um, I played a, uh, I played a woodlark on a on a recorder, which I which, which uh, people were laughing at it, but actually looking back, it actually was quite good. Uh, we've had since then we've had uh, Jess playing a uh, waxwing on a flute and uh, Ruben playing a cuckoo last week on a clarinet. So um, uh, this week we have uh, we have Jess back again. 
and this time she's on a kazoo. Uh, so I want to know what is uh, what bird is Jess playing on a kazoo? Here we go. You ready? I can't hear it, Michael. You can't hear it. No. no Where's that? Can you hear it, Barry? No. Oh, wait a minute. I bet I need to change my audio settings. We can't have that. It's uh, going to be a tough one to guess this one, isn't it? No, it's a tough one to guess. <laughs> um, it's going to be a tough one to guess. All right, okay, so um, audio settings. I'm pressing this a minute. What do I? No, I'm not sure what I press. Well, I, I know. I know what I need to do. I, I didn't. I know what I need to do. One second. Everyone, avert your gaze. Don't avert your gaze, folks. I need, I need to stop sharing. The, stop sharing the screen a minute. Here we are. I need to go behind the scenes. Uh, and all right, one second. Yeah, I did so well last week. I think. I think it would possibly be all right, James. I think we can get back on again now. Yeah. Um, if I if I if I share screen, now avert your gaze, James. Now avert your gaze. Here we are. Okay. Ah, share computer sound. All right. All right. Wait a minute. All right. Let's see. If this works. Okay. Let's. Uh, I can hear it loud and clear, of course. James. James, we're back in. We're back in, James. You can. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. This. You hear this now? I mean, you're probably, you're probably none the wiser, to be honest, are you? But um, uh, so uh, we'll, we'll play it again. Thank, thank you, Jess, for sending that in. Let's play it again. Look. Okay. So what's uh, what bird was Jess trying to um, replicate there? You can play at home, of course. Um, so uh, if I open these, if I open this, look, uh, there's Jess on kazoo. Okay, right. So there we go. So uh, James, any, any thoughts, James, on what, Je what Jess was trying to? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, my, my gut feeling before the list came up actually was Mallard, so I'm going to stick with Mallard, I think, on this occasion. Uh, Sean, Sean, do you have any views on that? Uh... Uh, uh, well, I, I have no idea, but I'm going to I'm going to go just for variety for Canada Goose. Canada Goose, okay. Well, there's a few Canada Goose. So, where were you, Barry? You, you spent a lot of time with Wildfowl. Any, uh... Yeah, that was a perfect Canada Goose. Oh. Perfect Canada Goose. Okay, well, let's um, let's okay. go and see. Uh, Thank you, folks. Let's say the vote. The votes come in. There's um, we had one person vote for great tit at the top. Um, bearded vulture got two two votes, but it's forty six percent said Canada goose, forty three percent said mallard. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's let's ask uh, let's ask Jess what she was trying to convey. Um, there we are. You, you see you can see the figures. I know, I know people people on the replay can't see this, but uh, oh, there's, there's the votes. Um, let's see what Jess was trying to convey. Um, and she was oh, wait, wait, I pressed the, I pressed the wrong button now. Here we are. It was Mallard. Oh. She was trying to do a duck. So well done, James. Uh, actually, to be honest, she wasn't even trying to do a Mallard. She actually was trying to do a great tit. Uh, but <laughs> she, yeah, but she pointed out that um, I tried to make the, the kazoo do a great tit, but it really only does ducks. Um, okay. You only, can, only can do ducks on kazoos, it seems. So uh, so thank you, Jess. Thank you for your... Uh, Next um, week, we could do geese. Yeah, well, you know, but, uh, so, so then... For those of you um, now, now, now I've worked out how we can get the sound working, we have a bonus. We have a bonus bird uh, this week. So thank you. So Sarah has sent in um, another mystery bird sound. Uh, this time with no instruments, she's actually going to just uh, play it on, a, on our hands. So, uh, all right. So if you can listen in and hear this. Here we are. Look. Whoop. Here we go. OK. Let's do that again. Okay, I hope you're, uh, hope you're playing at home. Well, let's get the, um, where's my thing? Let's, uh, oh, let's stop that, I'll stop that. Now I've got to go over here, do that. Ah, here we go. Okay, so um, what bird was Sarah playing on our hands there? James, what, what do you think? What are you going for with that one? Uh, I think that's, uh, I th I'd go with the male tawny owl on that one. So now, Sean, do you have a view on a, on that mystery call? Uh, I was going to embarrass myself by saying owl, but I wasn't going to be prepared to draw, be drawn on any further taxonomic distinction other than owl. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got uh, um, Barry. What, what are you going for? I'm tempted by collared dove. Well, okay, really? Okay. Uh, so uh, we end the point. We should look at look at the results. Now, most people uh, thought that Sarah was trying to uh, uh, convey the. Uh, the hooting noise of the tornado, uh, eighty-eight percent. Um, so uh, let's have a look, let's let's go and see what uh, what, what I press. How do I stop this? Okay, over there. All right. Uh, and Sarah was indeed it was indeed a tornado. Uh, so thank you, Sarah, for your uh, very skillful uh, rendition there. 
Um, Sarah pointed out she actually um, she sent she has a, a bird song app on her phone. She has a um, uh, she has an app and she actually she she hooted into the bird app. It, it, apparently you you can hold it up. It tells you the bird that's singing. It's one of those apps. Um, so she uh, she hooted into it and uh, guess what um, what species the bird app identified it as? Great tip. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you. It's uh, it's actually. I mean, I'm always laughing at these bird apps, but it was right because it came out as a, a human being, a homo sapiens that came out. So um, very good. Maybe these, these bird apps are better than I think they actually are. So uh, thank you to Jess and thank you to Sarah for sending those in. Of course, if you can play uh, any bird noise badly um, on, um, on, on your hands or on your, on your toes or whatever. Um, actually, don't, don't do it on your toes. No, don't, don't, don't send that. Um, that was but, good. Uh, you, you in, wasn't it? That was, that was good. Okay, maybe, maybe send it in, you yeah. know. It's Christmas, uh, so any bird noise played badly, uh, we'll try and uh, try and outsmart um, uh, James and, and Barry uh, next week. So thank you for that. Uh, back to some back with some photos, and here's some lovely pictures taken by uh, Andrew Holloway again. Some great sunsets uh, recently, um, uh, winter sunsets. Some lovely photographs taken here at uh, just off from Seaford. What's that New Haven? Uh, it's down there somewhere. <laughs> and um, it's a nice picture. I love this picture. It's very nice. What are they? Are they done in with that? What's some little. Uh, Little plovers, uh, sandpipers are going across there. Can't work them out. Um, some very atmospheric pictures here. Uh, but my favourite picture of the week comes from James Tomlinson, one of the uh, volunteers over at Rye here. Uh, look at that. It looks like, um, well, it looks like sort of a gannet in an Armageddon sort of situation here. It looks like, uh, but um, a lovely gannet flying across, flying across the sun. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, now you were telling me about gannets in the week, Barry. You sent, uh, you sent a video across. Should, should I play this? Yeah, this was the same morning, I think, um, or the following day. I was cycling along just after dawn along the reserve and I could hear all this strange noise, I got a hot, hot, hot noise. And it reminded me of my time in Shetland. And I, I peeked over the shingle bank and there was this flock of about 50 gannets diving in from great height. And they go at such tremendous speed and the, wow. the blackbirds are the cormorants. So most of these gannets are adults and they're very black and white, but a few of them are the darker, younger birds. But it was just uh, amazing. Just for 10 minutes, they were there um, fishing. Um, and it was, they're only about 50, 60 meters offshore. What sort of fish are they catching out there, Barry? If only I knew. <laughs> I know nothing about fish. <laughs> now, there's a nice, nice little link here into this. You know, that was our fishing little link because we got, uh, we got Sean and Sarah. Are you still, are you there, Sarah, behind the scenes? Is Sarah still with us? There she is, look. Something's, there she is. Are oh, you all right? Yeah, I'm here. You missed out on a thrilling uh, bird mystery sound. I thing. didn't, I didn't. I was I was here the whole time. Oh, right, okay. Just decided. I just to didn't, I didn't want to make, uh, embarrass <laughs> myself on, you know, in front of your wide audience. You had the dignity to uh, not, not take part in the uh, in that round. Um, so this is a picture which I which I saw a few months ago, uh, which I must admit I didn't know what was going on. This is a picture taken at Chichester Harbour. Um, now this is a well, I'll let you guys talk about it a bit more later on. This is a tuna. Um, now I until about last year, I've only just realised that tuna are absolutely huge. I thought tuna were like like this, um, and. This, this thing is massive. Now, I don't know anything about tuna, so that's why I've got Sarah and Sean here today. Hopefully, I, I, I'm absolutely fascinated by this, this beast, uh, and I, I don't know anything about it. So, uh, uh, so I'm going to pass hand over to you first, Sarah. But can you tell us a few things? I've got a picture of a bluefin tuna, and perhaps you can tell us a few things about what, how big they are, what they eat, anything. I'm, I'm, I'm all ears. Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, bluefin are the biggest of all the tuna. So there are lots of different species of tuna and I think bluefin are probably one of the um, the most sort of concerned, you know, of concern in terms of conservation as well. Correct me if I'm wrong there, Sean. Um, and yeah, they get up to about two metres in length on average. Obviously, they can get bigger. And um, so that photo that you just showed before that, you know, obviously you can see it um, by comparison to an average sized human there. It's a... Uh, pretty enormous um and i think on average about 450 kilos something like that and um, again that's that's average so it can go bigger can go smaller 
um, and they're incredibly valuable. So um, they sell for huge sums of money, you know, like individual fish literally selling for like millions of pounds or um, dollars, you know, whatever the <laughs> going currency is. So um, yeah, they're incredibly valuable and that's sort of why that's driven them to, to be of concern um, in terms of their conservation status because um, obviously with high value fish, a lot of fishermen want to target them. So are these, um, so are these the fish that we would eat in a can of tuna, bluefin tuna? Probably not. Okay. Um, right. If you buy a can of tuna, you would probably be able to look on the side, um, and it would tell you what kind of species would be likely to be in it. I think they tend to be a bit vague, um, but yeah. It, because bluefin is so valuable, um, it wouldn't be sort of mushed up into <laughs> the small chunks that you get in a can of tuna. But it's, it's an interesting point, actually, is that a lot of people wouldn't think to look at what's actually in a can of tuna because just it's, it's just tuna, isn't it? Yeah. And, are these, and what, are the, what are these tuna eating? Are they eating other fish? Well, that, that, well, that particular one is being caught on a line. Uh, yeah, that, that, that one's eating that. But yeah, the... the um, the, the tuna here, and we've, we've seen a couple of videos, there's a video on Facebook uh, of a school of tuna feeding just off the shore, uh, Brighton, just off the coast of Brighton, and they've been observed just off the shore and beach as well, that they're eating schooling fish like mackerel and, and herring. Um, you know, your gannets previously would have been feeding on a schooling fish, maybe small, small, small mackerel or something like that. But yeah, these big tuna are, are feeding on big schools of, of smaller fish like herring and mackerel. And yeah, no, you won't be eating bluefin tuna in tins. They they go to at very high prices, like Sarah said, to the to the Japanese sushi market, really. The right. smaller tuna species will be the ones you find in your tin, like skipjack tuna or albacore, the, uh, the other ones are sometimes called. Wow. So I, I put this map up, which I found online. I don't know. If, um, I don't know if this, this, this helps either of you to explain where tuna live. And I, I think it looks like these um, these circles around the Gulf of Mexico and the Mediterranean. This is where the bluefin tuna are spawning. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. They're they're uh, the Atlantic bluefin tuna, which is the species. There's kind of two subpopulations. And they uh, they breed in two different places. So so one low breed in the Mediterranean and one low breed breed in the Gulf of Mexico. And but when they they do very big migrations and they intermingle during their migrations, so they can feed in the same grounds, but they they split up to breed like that. Ah. so I've got, that, I've, got some, I've got some photos here, Sean. You mentioned there's some photos here of the Chichester uh, fish from a while back. I just I've got these. Uh, there's a it made the made the headlines. Well, not the headlines, but it made the uh, some news stories and picture pictures here but so this is quite unusual to see a tuna in sussex waters yeah so so the first picture you showed was you were right it was from chichester harbour it was found dead in chichester harbour but the picture you showed was actually in shoreham so um at the ifca we have a fisheries patrol vessel and we picked up the dead fish out of chichester harbour because i didn't really know what to do with it and uh we transported it to shoreham and uh did a uh, a rough and ready, shall we say, post-mortem on it because the University of Exeter is doing a study on them and they wanted some samples. For example, they wanted the otoliths, which is in, in a fish, it's like sort of a, a, akin to the ear bone, if you like. Um, but the otoliths are very useful for aging fish. You know, you, you can, it's like tree, trees, tree rings. You can age a fish using its otoliths uh, rings. Um, but we couldn't really get the otoliths out, so we had to just t send them the whole head. Uh, but so, so that, yeah, so that's so it. it the, the poor thing, uh, although it died in tragic circumstances, it, it, it uh, no, it was used for uh, a bit of science. Science there. The pic, the other picture you got there, that's a, another one that was found just outside Chichester, uh, and brought in by by a boat. Um, obviously, we don't know how the fish died. Um, there were no obvious, uh, uh, as far as we could tell, or the Exeter people could tell, there's no obvious like fishing injuries or anything. So it seems like they died of some sort of natural cause. I've been mulling it over and I was wondering in Chichester Harbour, because 
obviously, like you see, they're, they're very big fish. Uh, uh, they need to swim continuously to get oxygen over their over their gills. They they need quite a lot of oxygen to to keep them going all the time. And I was thinking that a, a big tuna like that caught in Chichester Harbour overnight might not survive because Chichester Harbour suffers from uh, excessive nutrient loading. It's a bit eutrophic, and in eutrophic waters, what tends to happen at night is that dissolved oxygen crashes uh, and a fish uh, like a big tuna that needs lots of oxygen might not make it through the night in a in a in a situation like that ah. uh, this uh, there's a video online i couldn't i couldn't download the video because i'm not that clever but this is a this is a still from it which is what you can see is some choppy water but in the video there seemed to be a a lot of tuna jumping out of the water and is that uh has that been confirmed sean were they tuna or yeah, well, we, we obviously the picture doesn't really show it in its full glory. It's quite an amazing video if people want to hunt it down on Facebook. Um, it's, it's a video of a, a school of tuna hunting off of Brighton. Uh, it's difficult to see how many there are there, but when you look at the, the breadth of the, of the school and the density of them keep popping up and jumping out the water uh, hunting, there's there's at least a hundred fish I reckon by my by my kind of just guesstimation. Um, so it's really nice to see and we and we had a a similar sighting to the what's in the video. Like I said, just from a from another uh, source, a, a, a Sussex spear fisherman who saw a very similar thing just off the beach off Shoreham. So very exciting because I live in Shoreham. It's very exciting to think oh. that they're they're hunting off off the off the beaches there. And again, there'll be they'll be hunting uh, schooling fish like herring and mackerel, just like in the Blue Planet. All right, brilliant. So this one uh, photographed in uh, a shore in Folkestone. So is, um, is there a reason that we're seeing tuna now? Are they increasing in population or? Um, well, I've, uh, I've done a bit of digging and, and um, it, it's a reasonably sad story for the tuna, I would say. I mean, because we think they're unusual now but um, it wasn't so long ago when they weren't very unusual. Um, I mean, tuna have been, bluefin tuna, we're talking especially the big bluefin tuna. They've been around the UK for, well, for before people were, were here really. And there are records of bluefin tuna vertebrae being found in excavations from 7,000 to about 4,000 BC in Copenhagen. Uh, and there's lots of records of them being caught, um, you know, in Holland in the 16th century uh, and Norway in the 18th century. And there, I believe there was even a, a, a recreational fishery off the northeast coast of, of the UK in the 19th century for, for these fish, a sport fishery. So they've been there for quite a long time. They've been around us for quite a long time. And um, what seems to have happened is, is you know, a familiar story in in with with fish and fisheries is is that a fishery opened up in Norway uh, in 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 the nineteen twenties really they started it's interesting they started fishing for them off Norway in the nineteen twenties because they were a pest they were they, they were uh, t stealing the herring and mackerel out the nets of, of the Norwegian fishermen and they didn't like it so they so they tried to harpoon them and and catch them in in Persanes to, to get rid of them. And, but the, uh, a canny Italian businessman got wind of this uh, and, and opened up a, a, an export market from Norway um, into Europe and then uh, presumably in, into Japan as well, because there's historically, there's been a really big uh, tuna fishery, bluefin tuna fishery in the Mediterranean. You've probably seen the, the images of, of uh, uh, lots of, uh, tanned fishermen with their big ring nets in in the Mediterranean Sea, and you know the Roman army used to be fed on on tuna. Um, and then as soon as that Norwegian fishery kind of opened, same old story, over exploitation, uh, and the numbers go down and down and down until until um, until about the 19, uh, 1960s when they pretty much disappeared. And I think the last record, the last tuna caught in the North Sea up until when we've seen them recently was in about 1985. So 
So you can see they kind of were there and then they kind of disappeared almost unnoticed by everyone. Um, and now it's really exciting to see them edging their way back. Right, right. I, mean, I, I, I feel really guilty of eating tuna now. I, I probably, you probably talked me out of eating fish for the rest of my life. I feel, Sarah, what, what sort of things, what, a person like me, who, who I, I do eat tuna, what sort of things should I be doing uh, when I buy my tuna to make sure I'm, 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 being, uh, sustainable, I'm being sustainably shopping my fish? Well, I suppose the, the first thing is I would suggest probably bluefin is off the shopping list if, uh, if possible. Can't afford it. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, it's not something that you would pick up in, in Tesco's anyway. I mean, it's it, you might find it in sort of specialist sushi bars, that kind of thing, as uh, Sean said. Um, but, you know, let's not forget there are uh, there are other species of tuna um, that are of less concern. And um, I mean, I, I don't know off the top of my head which of them are kind of the best ones. I think um, like yellowfin perhaps might be, you know, a better option. Um, but there's plenty of info about that. Various websites, uh, the Marine Conservation Society have um, their good fish guide. When you're actually in the shops, you can look for um, items that have got the little blue fish tick on them. Um, and then, of course, with tuna generally, um, it's always good to be aware about the different um, catch methods. So generally speaking, uh, pole and line is a, a much more um, environmentally friendly way to, to fish them. Um, it means, you know, there's far less bycatch, um, birds getting caught in, in long, let, long net lines, sorry. Um, that's, that's a big issue with tuna fisheries. So it's just being conscious about what it is that you're actually buying and, and giving a bit of thought to it rather than just picking up whatever the cheapest thing is. And I mean, that can be applied to, you know, any fish that you're buying in the supermarket or wherever is just have a little bit of thought about what it is that you're actually picking up and whether it is the most sustainable choice, whether it's got sustainable branding badge on it, that kind of thing. I, th I think Sarah makes a really good point there, Michael, that, that, that um, if people are interested in looking after the marine environment, then we need to remember that uh, wild caught fisheries are wildlife. And if you're buying fish to eat, which is fair enough, lots of people do that, just ask the right questions when you're buying that fish. Make sure it's from sustainable, proper sustainable sources, you know, so you want to know where it's come from, how you know, and what methods they use to catch it, you know, and, and do a bit of research if you if you feel strongly about it. It'd be really good. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I do feel strongly about it now. Now I've seen this uh, these tuna because I, I, I didn't know what they looked like or anything, and uh, they're amazing animals, really are. And the size of these things, incredible. So uh, they well, are they are incredible fish. I mean, they're just amazing fish to 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 behold, really. Mm. Um, wow. And what I've got a, a, my favourite fact actually about about the bluefin tuna is, is is a kind of rather obscure physiological one really is that they they've got like a, a, a counter current blood system. So a counter current blood system is a bit like what you've got in ducks' feet, where where the uh, where the where the heat is maintained uh, by a by the outgoing uh, blood vessels wrapping around the incoming blood vessels so that they they can maintain their temperature um, uh, higher than the ambient temperature around them. So because of that, tuna are actually are able to um, hunt in relatively cold waters. Wow. Amazing things. Well, well thank you, folks. That's, that's really, I've learned a lot there. I think I've learned a lot. I've learned a few new words tonight and uh, a little about tuna. So thank you. Thank you for popping in. There's, um, let's look, at, look at the comments and the questions down here before we finish. Uh, someone's... Um, Someone's asked Barry that um, if woodcocks, uh, we start the, the start of the show about woodcocks having 360 degree vision, uh, how come it flew into a window? Um, it's probably a good, uh, good question. Didn't see that coming. Um, will red wings fly over in heavy rain? Uh, someone asked James. Um, That's a good question. Um, probably not as much. I wouldn't have thought, but I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say definitively not. I don't really know the answer to that, to be honest. Strange. Uh, str and other questions, come uh, I know nothing else, there's some comments. Um, uh, there you go. It comes with rough-legged buzzers. People were saying that they, they, they've seen some, not that this year, but they've seen some in Sussex before. Um, okay, uh, now. Kent, Kent is good for rough-legged buzzer as well, obviously, because it's right on the coast, so. No, so look, oh. no, sorry, I need to turn this off a second. That goes there. Okay, now, 
what's next? What's coming up next? All right, so before we finish tonight, we have the, uh, the wax wing forecast. Uh, James has been keeping an eye on the, uh, the, the incoming wax wings, which uh, I'm hoping are going to come flooding into Sussex and, uh, and raise my spirits. But um, James, any more wax wings seen this, uh, this month? Oh, this there's, not, there's not, yeah, there's not many to report, Michael, to be honest. Um, I, I think, yeah, I think the closest ones are up in like sort of Northumberland. Um, but, I, you know, I mean, obviously last week I talked about there being a sighting in um, Norfolk, wasn't it? Norfolk. It was in yeah. Norfolk, but they, they seem to, uh, they seem to have gone north again. Um, oh, I think maybe, okay. you know, we haven't really had particularly conducive weather or sort of, you know, strong easterly winds to bring in lots of migrants either. Um, oh, okay. But yeah, they're, they're all a bit far afield at the moment, I'm afraid. No, no so good news on that front. So what I'm hearing, James, you're keeping it on moderate still. Yeah, I think it's going to have to stay on moderate, unfortunately. We're not raising our, we're not raising the wax wing level uh, this week. Not raising it at the moment, no. Okay. Um, all right. Well, maybe next week. Keep, maybe. Keep, uh, keep them peeled. Keep them peeled. Now, speaking of wax wings, we have some other talks coming up in the next um, uh, in the next week. I know some people have been asking about uh, upcoming talks in in the questions section down there. So James is doing a talk uh, next Wednesday. Uh, about winter birds in Sussex, so uh, I guess I'll have a few wax wings in that, James. Hopefully, because I put the picture of a wax wing on the uh, <laughs> uh, on, on the flyer. So no, uh, there'll be no wax wings in it now, Michael. Just to, uh... <laughs> yeah, to take it out now. Yeah. Uh, and also, also Barry, you're doing a talk uh, next Tuesday evening about uh, the flowers of Rye Harbour. Do you'll give a little bit of a intro to that. Just let, let us know what yeah. we're. It, we're won't, for. it won't be. A, it won't be about the um, winter flowers of Rye Harbour. It'll be looking at. Uh, the flowers in I think three different habitats here, reed bed, salt marsh, and the shingle habitat. Um, we'd be talking a little bit about the uh, the habitat, the large scale habitat creation projects that we've undertaken over the last few decades, and having a really close look at a few of the flowers. It won't be a long list of 508 species. Um, <laughs> it'll be um, highlights of the okay. Of the pretty and interesting flowers. That's that. That's what that's next. That's next Tuesday. You can book uh, for both these talks. There'll be, there'll be a link after the after this evening's webinar where it will take you across to there. And uh, we're back next next Thursday. I don't know why I put a short eared owl there, but uh, maybe we'll chat about short eared owls. So, uh, so send in your your photos and sightings to the nature table throughout the week, and we can uh, inspire us to talk about a few things uh, next Thursday. So we're back next Thursday at seven thirty. Uh, and so. Yeah, well, I think that that's the uh, leads me to say thank you for listening this evening. Uh, we've got a we've got a bit of a, another wet day tomorrow. I think there's sleet forecast tomorrow, so that looks nice. But hopefully, there'll be a chance to get out over the weekend and see some wildlife in Sussex. If you do, of course, send in your photos, send in your stories to the Nature Table, and we'll be able to uh, talk about them next week. Um, so, if you enjoyed this evening's show, as I always say, uh, it's always lovely to see people leaving a donation. Only a few pound uh, will uh, make us a lot of money. If you all left a few pound, it'd be fantastic. Uh, but there's a link um, coming up. So when I press when I press stop in a minute, hopefully, I think it's working. This is one thing I'm quite proud of. Usually when I press stop, you get magically taken to a uh, uh, to a page where you can leave a donation. And there'll be a few links there to other things, including some of James's uh, uh, thrush calls from uh, his talk yesterday. Uh, if you're not a member of the Wildlife Trust, if you're not a member, please consider joining us. We'd love to have you aboard. And uh, and that's it, really. So uh, thank you all. I'll We'll see you next week. Uh, Plenty of chance to see me and Barry and James talking next week. So have a great weekend. Uh, and thank you to, to Sarah. Are you still there, Sarah? Behind the scenes. I'll give you a quick wave. There she is. <laughs> I can see her. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. And thank you to Sean as well. Thank uh, you. Michael. That was really interesting. Thanks for coming on. And thank you to Barry and James as ever. And uh, and to and to Jess and to Sarah and to all the people who sent photographs uh, this week. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. And we'll see you next week. Have a great weekend and take care. Bye.